Well, hello again, Zach Heidi here. I know it's been a little bit since I uploaded, and that's because I've been super busy doing lots of composing projects and whatnot, and also just trying to spend time being more of a student and less of a teacher for the last month. So I've appreciated your patience, and it's been a great journey, and hopefully I have some things to share with you that I have learned in terms of music business, but also the composition side, orchestration, that sort of thing. So a couple weeks ago, I actually asked you all on Instagram, Twitter, and my other social media accounts what you'd like me to talk about, do a little Q&A. So I thought that'd be fun, so I'm gonna go through your questions in no particular order and hopefully share some of my insights on these subjects. As always, if you enjoy the content, a like really helps me out, subscribes are always nice, and if you wanna buy me a coffee, uh, that'd be great, although I am super caffeinated right now, so it'll be good for the Q&A. So Savage Music asked, how do you get started as a new composer and how do you promote yourself on social media correctly? Well, first of all, there's no correct way uh, to do any of this, really. I mean, that's kind of the beauty of doing a career as an artist is it's really more about forging your own path and determining what that is. So the first thing I'd encourage you to explore is, you know, what makes you excited? What do you enjoy doing, whether that's on social media or on the creative side? You know, do you like creating content on social media? Because if you don't, you know, there's plenty of other ways to kind of promote yourself, to network with other people. And you want to find something that's going to be most authentic to you because that's where you're going to really shine in your truest form. In terms of how to get started as a composer, honestly, the best thing you can do is just start. Just start writing. The biggest roadblock I hear from people is they don't feel ready, they don't feel like they know enough knowledge, and believe me, I understand. I still feel like I don't know what I'm doing at all. And, you know, even just this week, I was composing something and was like, man, am I even cut out for this? So that feeling never really goes away, I don't think, and that's because you're always in the pursuit of growing and getting better. So I would say, just get started. Just start writing something. If you feel like you want to network and try and get opportunities for film, just start. I know that's not specific and that's because there's so many ways you can do this and you have to experiment and be willing to fail or learn along the way. Bruno said, how long did it take studying music for you to start composing? Well, again, kind of on this subject, I've done both at the same time. You know, I didn't wait to start writing music. In fact, I didn't know anything about composing formally when I started writing. I started composing when I was about seven years old, um, right at the same time that I took piano lessons. I didn't really know that there was a difference between writing music and playing music at that time, which was to my benefit because I was uh, naive and just, just started writing. I've always explored music just because I enjoy it, um, not because I feel prepared or well-equipped to do it. And, you know, what I've tried to do is as I compose and write actively, the things that I want to learn and improve on, I do it retrospectively. So I'll write a piece, and then when I finish that piece, I'll look back and say, you know, what what could I have improved? But I don't use that, that knowledge gap as something that stops me from finishing a piece or writing in the first place. I really think that you have to just start doing this stuff in order to grow. Batakan says, what kind of free or low-cost VSTs or DAWs would you recommend to start out before? Yeah, so this is a great point because one of the big mistakes people make is they overinvest very early in VSTs, thinking it's going to make them sound better, that they need it for their production. When I started, I was using Cakewalk and plugging in like an, uh, an eighth-inch jack from the headphones into the microphone just because I thought that's how I needed to record the audio from a virtual instrument. I was working with really low-cost stuff, built-in VSTs. Um, you know, I used GarageBand for a long time before I even bumped up to Logic. And so um, in terms of what to start off with, there's no right answer, but there's lots of resources out there. Piano Books is a new resource from uh, Christian Henson, the guy from Spitfire, that has a lot of free VSTs. Lots of stuff you can check out. In terms of DAWs, I've only ever used Logic professionally, but if you have a Mac, GarageBand is a great place to start. It's, you know, Logic is like a souped up GarageBand. So if you get familiar with how to use GarageBand, it'll be a good launching pad into Logic. I'm sure there are some Windows equivalents uh, if you own a PC. Um, VSTs, you know, honestly, just do a quick search on Google and just see what you can find. There's lots of free stuff out there. Lots of these professional companies like 8DO, Embertone has lots of free stuff that you can find. Um, but definitely work within your means. You know, only get something if you really feel like you need it and try and space out those purchases along with um, you making income from your music. So that's what I've always done. You know, once I get a gig that pays well, I'll say, you know, I'm gonna take a portion of this and put it towards some new gear or software. Alvaro says, 
how do you sustain yourself during the 10 odd years it'll take to become a fully professional media composer? That's a really, really good question. Any random day job, better if it's remote, something music related, but related to the goal, part-time versus full-time. Yeah, so this is a great question. And what he's referring to is um, kind of a common piece of information that's spread around that says, you know, you should expect about 10 years before you're doing this full-time. If you're pursuing this really actively, it'll take about 10 years before you're a full-time media composer. In my experience, that's pretty true, actually. Um, even though you can get some odd jobs and paid gigs, it does take a while before it's a sustainable, singular source of income. So for me, you know, to be honest, I've had a lot of financial support and that's really helped me um, avoid having to take a job other than music. I also spent a lot of time in my hometown um, saving before I actually moved out of my hometown and, you know, had to start paying rent. So that was something I was very specific about. Like I did a lot of teaching gigs, um, piano gigs, playing at churches, anything I could do to just sustain some income and build it up before I took the plunge and moved somewhere new. So that's the first thing is keep your expenses low if you can in the beginning. Try and make sure that you can have the freedom to do your music stuff on the side. If you just jump out and move to LA immediately trying to get some work, you know, it can work, but the downside and the risk is that, you know, it's expensive out here. If you don't find that work immediately, it's gonna be really hard for you to find any time outside of your normal job to be able to take those risks, explore things creatively, meet new people. It's just really tough to do that. So keep your expenses low. In terms of what you can find, I mean, in my opinion, finding something that enables you the time to be able to explore music is good. So maybe that means finding some remote work if you can, so that you can stay at home and kind of allocate your time accordingly. Something part-time could be good too, uh, but ultimately this just comes down to whatever enables you time and finances to be able to do this. And it's gonna look different for different people based on your financial situation, uh, based on your needs, your interest, based on your other obligations, if you have family. And I would say, you know, on top of all this, don't put so much pressure on yourself to do this full time that it takes the fun out of it, you know? I've wanted to do this for a long time, but never at the expense of my actual enjoyment of it. If it starts to become, you know, a burden and something that you stress out about, you know, obviously there's gonna be some stress along this journey, but at the end of the day, remember why you're doing this, why you're doing music, you know? If your goal of music is just to enjoy it, you don't have to be doing it for a living. It's a crazy difficult path to be able to do this, and it requires a lot of support, a lot of help, a lot of luck, and a lot of time. And so just really, really determine if this is what you wanna do for a living or if this is just what you want in your life, because you can certainly make music in your life and not have it be your primary income, you know, which brings on all of the, the burdens of making it a business. Ethan Gervais said, how did your opportunity to work with Flashkits come to be and how has your experience been with them? Uh, Flashkits has been awesome. It is such a privilege to work with them and I, I feel very lucky with how it all turned out. So the short of it is um, they found me through the Armchair Historian, which is a animation channel on YouTube that I worked with for a while. And the reason I worked with Griff and the Armchair Historian was actually just shooting out an email. I happened to send him an email, I was looking for work at the time, and it just so happened that he was looking for some new music. So through that opportunity, I worked with him for a while, and we talked about having my music be put up on his secondary channel behind the armchair, I think it's called. So we had little tracks come up with my music playing, and I think that that's how Don found me on YouTube. So it was a very fortunate turn of events. Um, the first gig I did with Flash Gits, I actually had a trip right when they were uploading. I was going to Hawaii. So I had to crunch out this score in like two days, which at the time was terrifying for me, but I knew I had to do it so that we had the opportunity to work together and hopefully I could prove myself to them and continue to work with them. Uh, but yeah, my experience with them has been great. I love the variety that they do. We always do different styles. I never know what to expect from them. The guys are hilarious and they also treat me super well. So it's been a pleasure working with them. And you know, you never know how these opportunities are going to happen. That's something that I just, I, I've learned and always been perpetually surprised by is I never know where my next gig is going to come from. I always try to make sure that when I'm working with someone and it, it seems like a cool opportunity that I find ways to position myself to be able to get my music out there to more people. So with Flash Kits, for example, I have them put my YouTube link underneath all of the credits in the video descriptions because hopefully somebody will find me through them 
and I can work with someone else in the future. So it's kind of like the snowballing effect. George says, who are your top five favorite film composers? Oof. Um, well, top of the list would probably be John Powell. I love everything that that man writes. He's just, just a genius. John Williams has to be up there because he was, you know, one of the catalysts for me starting to want to do this. Thomas Newman, huge inspiration for me. You know, I think I'd put Joe Hisaishi up there. Uh, he's someone I discovered more recently, even though I know everybody knows his stuff, but really impacted my writing in a very short amount of time. So currently he'd be up there and maybe Henry Mancini for a fifth. He's a jazz composer, um, but he's had a huge influence on my music too in very subtle ways. I don't think people would, would know that I like his music. He writes such a balance and crazy blend of humorous music, sentimental stuff, groovy stuff. He's just really, really incredible. If you don't know Mancini's stuff, I highly recommend you check it out, but you definitely will once you start looking him up. Philly Lando says, can you explain how you set up the scene and tempo on Logic before starting scoring? So there may be a video out already where I've discussed this, and if not, then it's coming out soon. But the first thing that I'll do is I'll actually look at the scene and try and imagine a piece of music playing and what that tempo would be. And that might be determined by, you know, first of all, the launch point when there's a sound or something that happens on screen that initiates the music. And then I might be looking for the next hit point and kind of counting. So I try these days not to have too many tempo changes because um, it's problematic when you have edits. And it's also just not really necessary. You know, I used to try and really hit everything on the nose with my tempo, but these days I'm less precious about that and that really helps. Um, once I've set a tentative tempo, you can use beat mapping if you use logic, something like that to kind of lock in those points. Uh, but I'll adjust those tempos accordingly based on what's happening on screen. So if I really feel like there absolutely needs to be a tempo change, then I'll do that accordingly. Uh, but the tempo information might happen in tandem with the music making. So sometimes I'll start a cue and be like, you know what, this tempo's not working and have to adjust. All these things happen uh, not in total sequence, but sort of overlapping into each other. So setting that tempo is kind of your best guess. It's a bit of guesswork. And then you might have to accommodate that as you write your music. In my video about composing for animation, there's gonna be a new one coming out where I talk about it in a more technical format and you'll see how I actually do that. Bara says, a uh, big fan of you and Mattia, thank you. Here's my question, do film composers need to learn to mix their music? Um, and how do you learn about mixing? Absolutely, yes, yes, yes. In the beginning, you have to do everything yourself and production is a huge component of that. Um, when I was back in Oceanway Studios doing some part prep, I had the privilege to meet Kevin Kiner, who is the composer for Clone Wars. He's a really nice guy. And I remember sitting down and talking with him and one of the things he really impressed on me was get your mock-ups to sound good because the budgets are low in the beginning of these things and you're not working with live orchestras and that's gonna be a huge part of what makes your sound and how people perceive your craftsmanship, you know? It's funny, like, I kind of teeter back and forth. Sometimes I'm focusing on composition, sometimes I'm focusing on production, mock-ups, mixing, but they're all important components of being able to be perceived as a professional in this industry. So yes, learn how to mix for sure. You don't have to learn it academically, but be sure to practice that and improve. In terms of resources, uh, there's a great composer on YouTube named Joel uh, Ladoli. I'm probably mispronouncing that but he has orchestral music courses and YouTube videos that I definitely recommend. I will link him in the description. Learn about basic EQ, learn about compression, learn how to use reverb. I have videos on those subjects as well that you can check out. There's also a really good book called um, Mixing Secrets for the Home Studio, I think, by Mike Senior. That was a really influential book on me that really helped uh, me kind of find my way in the beginning. So I recommend that. And again, like I said, you know, you're gonna learn through trial and error. So make the music, finish the music, mix it. Don't spend three weeks mixing it. You're gonna learn more just spending a two hour session and then reflecting on what you can improve on than just you know banging your head against a wall, trying this thing for weeks and then just giving up on the mix altogether. So don't wait for it to be a perfect mix. Just release it and move on. Gina said, what's up Gina? She said, what's the first song you ever learned on the piano? Um, well, I wasn't taught it, but the first song I was ever caught playing was uh, the Flintstones theme. My parents found me when I was like, according to them, I was like two years old. They had bought me like a little toy xylophone with like colors on it. And I guess they thought the TV was on because they heard the Flintstones. So they came downstairs and then they saw that I was playing it. I don't remember this. I can't testify. You'd have to ask them. But 
I think that's the first song I officially learned <laughs> on the piano, on the xylophone. Maybe that counts. <laughs> Blamotis says, can you talk about how you layer different libraries, specifically strings? So believe it or not, I actually don't really layer libraries. Um, strings occasionally. What I've done these days is um, I've merged Cinematic Studio strings with the solo strings. I have them play together. And then sometimes, sometimes I'll have an ensemble pad, but I generally don't. It's just, it's very time consuming for me. And I kind of am focused on expedience. If I was gonna layer strings, what I would probably do is I would get the mix sounding right individually between the two. I would make sure the delay compensation, like the track delay is correct so that if I were to record enable them both at the same time and play, they would line up. And something that I'll do often is if I'm gonna be doing that, like double track recording, I'll experiment with different like scripts or make sure that the velocities and the expression kind of line up. So as I use like the breath controller or fader and I play things in, we're not having extreme like dynamic jumps in one track whereas they're not existing in the other. So I try to make sure that they play very similarly together and would be all lined up and proper before I even layer them. But honestly, no, I don't really layer stuff very often. That's where I made sure that like my mix for those individual string libraries is really strong. So hopefully I don't need to, but I know there are plenty of composers who do. Jeremy says, what are your thoughts on film scoring graduate programs? What's the best way to go about using the resources to network and give yourself the best chances post-grad? So I studied classical composition, uh, which was a great major and I'm really glad I did it. Um, with that said, you know, if you're going to go out and do this, recognize it's a huge investment and make the best possible use of your time while you're there. That doesn't just mean taking the courses. It means connecting with your fellow students, connecting with your teachers, asking for help, trying to get opportunities with them, collaborating, creating lots of things together. You know, I think the social aspect is the one of the biggest benefits of college, honestly, in terms of what happens afterwards. Uh, I've gotten several opportunities from teachers, from students that I connected with, and that's been really important and helpful in my career. The craft alone, the, the classes I, I took, the courses I studied, Helpful, of course, yes, helpful, but not not the make or break to what's helped my career. So if you're gonna do this, make sure that, you know, if you're introverted, get over it. <laughs> Start talking with people, get comfortable working with other people. This business is a collaborative one and you have to focus on meeting other people and connecting with other people genuinely. And with that in mind, you don't even necessarily need to do a film scoring program, although you might get better opportunities like assistant gigs and things like that if you do. Like I said, I studied classical and um, I feel like I benefited. Maybe I missed out on certain things from a film scoring program. I'm not even sure if like doing film scoring as the major specifically is better than doing like classical composition or music production. I'm not really sure it matters too much beyond uh, the people that you're gonna meet and connect with. So, um, you know, and you don't have to do a full four year program either. Some people like to do like summer courses or something like that or a camp or just go for like a one year program. I think there's a few that have that and you might get similar benefits. It ultimately comes down to you and how proactive you are about reaching out to other people and connecting with your community. Joshua David Mitchell says, everyone says to move to LA if you wanna go into film scoring, but what do you do when you get there? Should you try and have a job or internship lined up before moving or just go straight there without any prospects? Yeah, so this is a really common um, discussion point amongst film composers, like do you go to LA? I have opinions that might differ from other people. See, I'm in LA and I love it. And I'm here specifically and moved here because I wanted to move here, not because I felt like I needed to move here. My story is uh, I'm from Connecticut originally and I went to Tennessee first before moving to LA. I chose Tennessee because I thought it would be a little cheaper to live there than LA. I wanted to kind of find my footing and really just see if I could make a living making music before I even thought about moving here. So. I was at a point in my life where I was already sustaining my income before I did this. And I, I'm i really glad I did it that way because, well, first of all, quarantine hit as soon as I got here, which would have been crazy stressful, but it just gave me a little bit of backbone, foundation, and security before I came here. I already had some clients I was working with. I was already making income through YouTube, other various sources before I came here. And it took some of that stress off of actually moving here. I think the answer to should you move to LA depends on why you want to move there, what you think you'll gain, and what position you're in. So 
you know, if you're not making any income, it's really hard for me to recommend coming to LA. It's just gonna make things more difficult for you. You know, you may find some work, but a lot of the work in the beginning, if you're really desperate to find something, is gonna be very low income and very long hours. And, you know, it's gonna be hard to sustain that if you can't support yourself. So my recommendation is get to a point in your career where you already have some things built up before you try moving out here. And don't move here for the prospect exclusively of finding work. I think it's that's the wrong mindset to have. I think you'd want to move here, like why I moved here, was to be connected with the community, to meet some new people, to have some fun, explore the area, be close to some of these events. You know, there's, there's benefits that exist here, and that's, I think, why it is expensive to live here. But just going to get work, I think, is going to be really discouraging and is a bit of a short-sighted goal that um, I think is just hard to sustain out here. You know, I don't plan on living in LA forever. Currently, I really love it. I'm actually in Pasadena, so I'm not even in, like, LA, LA, um, but I enjoy it on a personal level and that's why I stay. I'm probably at a point in my career where I could move out of here and be okay financially uh, and be able to make a living because most of the work I do, even when I'm here, is remote. Um, but what I use LA for is for the personal benefits, you know, this beautiful weather, obviously, I love the events, and I'll go and have like coffee meetups with people that I've wanted to connect with. And that's, you know, what does lead to work in the future, those face-to-face -face things. But oftentimes they're like one-offs, you know? I have coffee with somebody, I chat with them, uh, we connect, and then I don't hear from them for a year and a half, and then a gig comes along. So, you know, could you do that remotely? Probably, yeah. You could maybe just fly out here and network with a couple people that you want to and hope that something happens from it. It just depends. It always, always just depends. I hate giving out really objective, like, singular advice because this career has so many different routes that you can take. But if you do move out here, then yes, I recommend you build up a list of people that you want to connect with. Um, you have some sort of a support system financially when you come out here so that you're you're okay. Uh, it's risky as heck to come out here without any savings, so make sure you have some savings built up. And just remember, just because you see people that you admire moving out here does not mean that it's the right path for you. Explore what really sits in your heart, what really drives you personally, and don't get swayed by what you hear, oh, everybody's going and doing this, uh, if it doesn't feel right for you. Okay, that is gonna do it for this Q&A. I got a bunch of questions, and hopefully I answered most of yours. The some that I didn't answer, so uh, if you wanna reiterate them in the comments, then I'll see if I can answer them below. Hopefully you found this helpful, and I just wanna restate, because it's been on my mind recently, you know, I am just as much a student as I am a teacher. I am basing all my answers off of my experience, and I highly recommend that you challenge them if you disagree, or consult with other people that you trust in your life to see what they think about these decisions. Don't take my answers at face value. This is just what I have learned and the opinions I've formed through my own personal experiences. If you did find this helpful or you enjoyed the discussion, then again, please leave a like, subscribe for more. If you have more questions you want me to answer, then leave them in the comments and then maybe I'll do this like once a month or something like that. But otherwise, thanks for your support as always and I hope you have a great week.